Hi everybody, it's spring and it's autumn uh, and so I have had this craving to, uh, to go camping and be around a campfire with you but uh, it is um, the middle of the week and Sadly, like you, I'm probably stuck at home in the city and you might be in the city, you might be in the suburbs, or maybe you are out in the wilderness or the country. And if you are, say hello to it for me. But my favorite thing about cold weather is gathering around a fire and telling scary stories and um, this is something I'd really like to do so I thought we could kind of go on an imagination vacation uh, and so if you will lend me your imagination we can go camping and I will tell you a story uh, that is not too scary. It's written by someone you might know. His name is Roald Dahl and he is most famous for his beloved but slightly deranged uh, children's stories. And you may have a uh, grown up reading them. I, however, <laughs> was a bit of a strange kid and instead of reading his um, children's books, I read a lot of the things he wrote for adults. And they are even stranger in some ways. If you like uh, the kind of content you might see from Alfred Hitchcock, for example, or uh, that you might read in Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, you will like Roald Dahl's adult stories, I believe. In fact, Hitchcock adapted uh, one of his stories, at least one of them, into an episode of Alfred Hitchcock Presents, which is one of my all-time favorite television shows. Love it. It's amazing if you've never seen it. Uh, and uh, that episode is called Lamb to the Slaughter, and that is the name of that story as well. Uh, the reason I bring up Edgar Allan Poe is because, like Poe, Roald Dahl has an excellent sense of how to start a story and end a story exactly where it needs to start and end. And, of course, that sounds quite obvious. Uh, however, it is very difficult to do. And Roald Dahl, like Poe before him, is able to tell you just enough information so you get the twist or the, the the impression of where the narrative will head without taking you all the way there and I find the effect of this to be quite creepy because the power of our minds to uh, to create is much, much greater than anyone else's power to manipulate our emotions. So, doll always stops where you know what's going to happen, but you don't quite see the action. And that 
gives your mind the power to imagine something that will be suitable and, again, somewhat deranged in your own mind. <laughs> oh, this makes me sound a little weird, but I think you've already arrived at that conclusion. Anyway, uh, but I won't read you anything too frightening. If anything, I think this story is quite funny, and, uh, so I don't think it should be, uh, too scary for relaxation. Uh, and it's one of my all-time favorite short stories, and so I am so excited to share it with you. The first thing I want to do is get us out to that campfire setting, and I'll need a little imagination from you. This room behind me, as you've seen in many videos, is my, uh, my extra room, my bonus room, I don't know what you call it, uh, and it's where I play video games and, um, practice my hobbies and work, but I don't think it's quite right. I'm going to ask you to start closing your eyes and start imagining a, a group of people who you really, really love and we're all going to sit around the fire together and I want you to smell the pine and the bark and the soil and start to hear the crackle of the fire and as we take this trip outdoors uh, you'll begin to hopefully accept that you are no longer in your room maybe you are with me around a fire and smoke and stars and finally a story and that story starts like this The Landlady by Roald Dahl Billy Weaver had traveled down from London on the slow afternoon train with the change at Reading on the way and by the time he got to bath, it was about nine o'clock in the evening, and the moon was coming up out of a clear, starry sky over the houses opposite the station entrance. But the air was deadly cold, and the wind was like a flat blade of ice on his cheeks. Excuse me, he said, but is there a fairly cheap hotel not too far away from here? Try the Bell and Dragon. The porter answered, pointing down the road. They might take you in. It's about a quarter of a mile along on the other side. Billy thanked him and picked up his suitcase and set out to walk the quarter mile to the Bell and Dragon. He had never been to Bath before. He didn't know anyone who lived there. But Mr. Greenslade at the head office in London had told him it was a splendid town. Find your own lodgings, he had said, and then go along and report to the branch manager as soon as you've got yourself settled. Billy was 17 years old. He was wearing a new navy blue overcoat, a new brown trilby hat, and a new brown suit, and he was feeling fine. He walked briskly down the street. He was trying to do everything briskly these days. Briskness, he had decided, was the one common characteristic of all successful businessmen. The big shots up at the head office were absolutely fantastically brisk all the time. They were amazing. There were no shops on this wide street that he was walking along, only a line of tall houses on each side, all of them identical. They had porches and pillars and four or five steps going up to their front doors and it was obvious that, once upon a time, they had been very swanky residences. But now, even in the darkness, 
He could see that the paint was peeling from the woodwork on their doors and windows, and that the handsome white facades were cracked and blotchy from neglect. Suddenly, in a downstairs window that was brilliantly illuminated by a street lamp not six yards away, Billy caught sight of a printed notice propped up against the glass in one of the upper panes. It said, Bed and Breakfast. There was a vase of yellow chrysanthemums, tall and beautiful, standing just underneath the notice. He stopped walking. He moved a bit closer. Green curtains, some sort of velvety material, were hanging down on either side of the window. The chrysanthemums looked wonderful beside them. He went right up and peered through the glass into the room and the first thing he saw was a bright fire burning in the hearth. On the carpet, in front of the fire, a pretty little dachshund was curled up asleep with its nose tucked into its belly. The room itself, so far as he could see in the half-darkness, was filled with pleasant furniture. There was a baby grand piano, and a big sofa, and several plump armchairs, and in one corner he spotted a large parrot in a cage. Animals were usually a good sign in a place like this, Billy told himself. And, all in all, it looked to him as though it would be a pretty decent house to stay in. Certainly, it would be more comfortable than the Bell and Dragon. On the other hand, a pub would be more congenial than a boarding house. There would be beer and darts in the evenings and lots of people to talk to. And it would probably be a good bit cheaper, too. He had stayed a couple of nights in a pub once before, and he had liked it. He had never stayed in any boarding houses, and, to be perfectly honest, he was a tiny bit frightened of them. The name itself conjured up images of watery cabbage, rapacious landladies, and a powerful smell of kippers in the living room. After dithering about like this in the cold for two or three minutes, Billy decided that he would walk on and take a look at the Bell and Dragon before making up his mind. He turned to go. And now a queer thing happened to him. He was in the act of stepping back and turning away from the window when all at once his eye was caught and held in the most peculiar manner by the small notice that was there. Bed and breakfast, it said. Bed and breakfast. Bed and breakfast. Bed and breakfast. Each word was like a large black eye staring at him through the glass, holding him, compelling him, forcing him to stay where he was and not to walk away from that house. And the next thing he knew, he was actually moving across from the window to the front door of the house, climbing the steps that led up to it and reaching for the bell. He pressed the bell, Far away in a back room, he heard it ringing, and then at once, it must have been at once, because he hadn't even had time to take his finger from the bell button, the door swung open, and a woman was standing there. Normally, you ring the bell, and you have at least a half minute's wait before the door opens, but this thing was like a jack-in-the-box. He pressed the bell, and out she popped. It made him jump. She was about forty-five or fifty years old, and the moment she saw him, she gave him a warm, welcoming smile. Please, come in, she said pleasantly. She stepped aside, holding the door wide open, and Billy found himself automatically starting forward. The compulsion, or more accurately, the desire to follow after her into that house was extraordinarily strong. I saw the notice in the window, he said, holding himself back. Yes, I know. I was wondering about a room. It's all ready for you, my dear, she said. She had a round pink face and very gentle blue eyes. I was on my way to the Bell and Dragon, Billy told her, but the notice in your window just happened to catch my eye. My dear boy, she said, why don't you come in out of the cold? How much do you charge? Five and sixpence a night, including breakfast. It was fantastically cheap. 
it was less than half of what he had been willing to pay. If that's too much, she added, uh, then perhaps I can reduce it just a tiny bit. Do you desire an egg for breakfast? Eggs are expensive at the moment. It would be sixpence less without the egg. Five and sixpence is fine, he answered. I should like very much to stay here. I knew you would. Do come in. She seemed terribly nice. She looked exactly like the mother of one's best school friend welcoming one into the house to stay for the Christmas holidays. Billy took off his hat and stepped over the threshold. Just hang it there, she said, and let me help you with your coat. There were no other hats or coats in the hall. There were no umbrellas, no walking sticks, nothing. We have it all to ourselves, she said, smiling at him over her shoulder as she led the way upstairs. You see, it isn't very often I have the pleasure of taking a visitor into my little nest. The old girl is slightly dotty, Billy told himself, but at five and sixpence a night, who cares about that? I should have thought you'd be simply swamped with applicants, he said politely. Oh, I am, my dear, I am, of course. Of course I am, but the trouble is that I'm inclined to be just a teeny weeny bit choosy in particular, if you see what I mean. Uh, yes. But I'm always ready. Everything is always ready, day and night, in this house, just on the off chance that an acceptable young gentleman will come along. And it is such a pleasure, my dear, such a very great pleasure, when now and again I open the door and I see someone standing there who is just exactly right. She was halfway up the stairs and she paused with one hand on the stair rail, turning her head and smiling down at him with pale lips. Like you, she added, and her blue eyes traveled slowly all the way down the length of Billy's body to his feet, and then up again. On the second floor landing, she said to him, This floor is mine. They climbed up another flight. And this one is all yours, she said. Here's your room. I do hope you'll like it. She took him into a small but charming front bedroom, switching on the lights as she went in. The morning sun comes right in the window, Mr. Perkins, it is Mr. Perkins, isn't it? No, he said. It's Weaver. Mr. Weaver. How nice. I put a water bottle between the sheets to air them out, Mr. Weaver. It's such a comfort to have a hot water bottle in a strange bed with clean sheets. Don't you agree? And you may light the gas fire at any time if you feel chilly. Thank you, Billy said. Thank you. Ever so much. He noticed that the bedspread had been taken off the bed and that the bedclothes had been neatly turned back on one side, all ready for someone to get in. I'm so glad you appeared, she said, looking earnestly into his face. I was beginning to get worried. That's all right, Billy said brightly. You mustn't worry about me. He put his suitcase on the chair and started to open it. And what about supper, my dear? Did you manage to get anything to eat before you came here? <laughs> I'm not a bit hungry, thank you, he said. I think I'll just go to bed as soon as possible because tomorrow I've got to get up rather early and report to the office. Very well, then. I'll leave you now so that you can unpack. But... Before you go to bed, would you be kind enough to pop into the sitting room on the ground floor and sign the book? Everyone has to do that because it's the law of the land, and we don't want to go breaking any laws at this stage in the proceedings, do we? <laughs> she gave him a little wave of the hand and went quickly out of the room and closed the door. Now, the fact that his landlady appeared to be slightly off her rocker didn't worry Billy in the least. After all, she not only was harmless, there was no question about that, but she was also quite obviously a kind and generous soul. 
He guessed that she had probably lost a son in the war, or something like that, and had never gotten over it. So, a few minutes later, after unpacking his suitcase and washing his hands, he trotted downstairs to the ground floor and entered the living room. His landlady wasn't there, but the fire was glowing in the hearth, and the little dachshund was still sleeping soundly in front of it. The room was wonderfully warm and cozy. I'm the lucky fellow, he thought, rubbing his hands. This is a bit of all right. He found the guest book lying open on the piano, so he took out his pen and wrote down his name and address. There were only two other entries above his on the page, and, as one always does with guest books, he started to read them. One was a Christopher Mulholland from Cardiff. The other was Gregory W. Temple from Bristol. That's funny, he thought suddenly. Christopher Mulholland. It rings a bell. Now where on earth had he heard that rather unusual name before? Was it a boy at school? No. Was it one of his sister's numerous young men, perhaps? Or a friend of his father's? No, no, it wasn't any of those. He glanced down again at the book. Christopher Mulholland, 231 Cathedral Road, Cardiff. Gregory W. Temple, 27 Sycamore Drive, Bristol. As a matter of fact, now he came to think of it, he wasn't at all sure that the second name didn't have almost as much of a familiar ring about it as the first. Gregory Temple, he said aloud, surging his memory. Christopher Mulholland. Such charming boys, a voice behind him answered, and he turned and saw his landlady sailing into the room with a large silver tea tray in her hands. She was holding it well out in front of her, and rather high up, as though the tray were a pair of reins on a frisky horse. They sound somehow familiar, he said. They do? How interesting. I'm almost positive I've heard those names before somewhere. Isn't that odd? Maybe it was in the newspapers. Uh, they weren't famous in any way, were they? I mean famous cricketers or footballers or something like that. Famous, she said, setting the tea tray down on the low table in front of the sofa. Well, no, I don't think they were famous, but they were incredibly handsome. Both of them, I can promise you that. They were tall and young and handsome and, my dear, just exactly like you. Once more, Billy glanced down at the book, Look here, he said, noticing the dates. This last entry is over two years old. It is. Yes, indeed, and Christopher Mulholland's is nearly a year before that, more than three years ago. Dear me, she said, shaking her head and heaving a dainty little sigh. Oh, I would never have thought it. How time does fly away from us all, doesn't it, Mr. Wilkins? It's Weaver, Billy said. W-E-A-V-E-R. Oh, of course it is, she cried, sitting down on the sofa. How silly of me. I do apologize. In one ear and out the other, that's me, Mr. Weaver. You know something, Billy said. Something that's really quite extraordinary about all this. No, dear, I don't. Well, you see, both of those names, Mulholland and Temple, I not only seem to remember each one of them separately, so to speak, but somehow or other, in some peculiar way, they both appear to be sort of connected together as well, as though they were both famous for the same sort of thing, if you see what I mean. Like, well... Like Dempsey and Tooney, for example, or Churchill and Roosevelt. How amusing, she said. 
But come over here now, dear, and sit down beside me on the sofa, and I'll give you a nice cup of tea and a ginger biscuit before you go to bed. You really shouldn't bother, Billy said. I didn't mean you to do anything like that. He stood by the piano, watching her as she fussed about with the cups and saucers. He noticed that she had small, white, quickly moving hands and red fingernails. I'm almost positive it was in the newspapers I saw them, Billy said. I'll think of it in a second. I'm sure I will. There's nothing more tantalizing than a thing like this that lingers just outside the borders of one's memory. He hated to give up. Now wait a minute, he said. Wait just a minute. Mulholland, Christopher Mulholland, wasn't that the name of the Eaton schoolboy who was on a walking tour through the West Country and then all of a sudden, milk, she said, and sugar? Yes, please. And then all of a sudden, Eaton schoolboy, she said. Oh no, my dear, that can't possibly be right because my Mr. Mulholland was certainly not an Eaton schoolboy when he came to me. He was a Cambridge undergraduate. Uh, come over here now and sit next to me and warm yourself in front of this lovely fire. Come on, your tea's all ready for you. She patted the empty place beside her on the sofa, and she sat there smiling at Billy and waiting for him to come over. He crossed the room slowly and sat down on the edge of the sofa. She placed his teacup on the table in front of him. There we are, she said. How nice and cozy this is, isn't it? Billy started sipping his tea. She did the same. For half a minute or so, neither of them spoke. But Billy knew that she was looking at him. Her body was half turned toward him, and he could feel her eyes resting on his face, watching him over the rim of her teacup. Now and again, he caught a whiff of a peculiar smell that seemed to emanate directly from her person. It was not in the least unpleasant, and it reminded him... Well, he wasn't quite sure what it reminded him of. Pickled walnuts? New leather? Or was it the corridors of a hospital? At length, she said, Mr. Mulholland was a great one for his tea. Never in my life have I seen anyone drink as much tea as dear, sweet Mr. Mulholland. I suppose he left fairly recently, Billy said. He was still puzzling his head about the two names. He was positive now that he had seen them in the newspapers, in the headlines. Left, she said, arching her brows. But my dear boy, he never left. He's still here. Mr. Temple is also here. They're on the fourth floor, both of them together. Billy set his cup down slowly on the table and stared at his landlady. She smiled back at him and then she put out one of her white hands and patted him comfortingly on the knee. How old are you, my dear? she asked. Seventeen. Seventeen, she cried. Oh, it's the perfect age. Mr. Mulholland was also seventeen, but I think he was a trifle shorter than you are. In fact, I'm sure he was, and his teeth weren't quite so white. You have the most beautiful teeth, Mr. Weaver. Did you know that? They're not as good as they look, Billy said. They've got simply masses of fillings on them at the back. Mr. Temple, of course, was a little older, she said, ignoring his remark. He was actually twenty-eight, and yet I never would have guessed it if he hadn't told me, never in my whole life. There wasn't a blemish on his body. Uh, uh, what? Billy said. His skin was just like a baby's. There was a pause. Billy picked up his teacup and took another sip of his tea. Then he set it down again gently in its saucer. He waited for her to say something else, but she seemed to have lapsed into another of her silences. He sat there staring straight ahead of him into the far corner of the room, 
biting his lower lip. That parrot, he said at last, you know something. It had me completely fooled when I first saw it through the window. I could have sworn it was alive. Alas, no longer. It's most terribly clever the way it's been done, he said. It doesn't look in the least bit dead. Who did it? I did. You did? Of course, she said. And have you met my little Basil as well? She nodded toward the dachshund, curled up so comfortably in front of the fire. Billy looked at it, and suddenly he realized that this animal had all the time been just as silent and motionless as the parrot. He put out a hand and touched it gently on the top of its back. The back was hard and cold, and when he pushed the hair to one side with his fingers, he could see the skin underneath, grayish black and dry and perfectly preserved. Good gracious me, he said. How absolutely fascinating. He turned away from the dog and stared with deep admiration at the little woman beside him on the sofa. It must be awfully difficult to do a thing like that. Not in the least, she said. I stuff all my little pets myself when they pass away. Will you have another cup of tea? No, thank you, Billy said. The tea tasted faintly of bitter almonds, and he didn't much care for it. You did sign the book, didn't you? Oh, yes. That's good, because later on, if I happen to forget what you were called, then I could always come down here and look it up. I still do that almost every day with Mr. Mulholland and Mr. Uh, Mr. Temple, Billy said. Gregory Temple. Excuse my asking, but haven't there been any other guests here except them in the last two or three years? Holding her teacup high in one hand, inclining her head slightly to the left, she looked up at him out of the corners of her eyes and gave him another gentle little smile. No, my dear, she said. Only you. I really sincerely hope you enjoyed that. I think it's a phenomenal ending. And uh, even though it's a little bit sad, creepy, <laughs> disturbing, I hope that uh, you can just see the humor, the imagination in it. And um, I mentioned in the first part that the form of this story is actually quite sophisticated and if you will be taking part in my language classes it may be something to think about how do we tell stories where we end at just the right point of having told just enough to express the impression of what's about to happen but we give the reader, the authority to imagine that end on their own. And I think it's quite lovely and wonderful, <laughs> even in this very silly, strange, and theatrical kind of context. But what great characters, right? Anyway, um, if you'd like more stories, uh, please let me know. I always love to read to you. And I We'll look forward to hearing any of your suggestions for good, scary stories, too. So, I will see you very soon. I wish you very sweet, very kind, and easy dreams. And I hope that you enjoy the spirit of autumn. And it's almost October now, and it's just exciting. I hope you love it as much as I do. See you soon.